is exciting for or what has been exciting for a lot of artists is the choice of controlled randomness. All right, Crypto Slam Clubhouse fam, let's jump into some upcoming drops. According to a Forbes article, 25% of all professional careers in North America will be remote by the end of 2022. While work from home jobs have become more commonplace, many Web3 enthusiasts are preparing for the next evolution of remote work in the metaverse. MetaPlace's offices is a free mint NFT collection that will allow holders to own virtual offices in the MetaPlace's world metaverse. Office holders will be able to invite clients and team members to their virtual space by sharing a URL. The MetaPlace's offices collection will be released in two phases. 4,000 small offices will be available for the free mint, which began on November 15th, and the large offices will be available for a paid mint on November 30th. Now, this next drop is hoping to introduce fitness to the Cardano ecosystem. Fitness Empire Metaverse is looking to become the first move to earn platform on Cardano. The project hopes to allow holders to own to earn tokens through an array of activities, including swimming, running, tennis, cricket, and much more. The Fitness Empire Metaverse land sale will begin on November 18th with a collection size of 5,000. Land holders will be able to earn ADA through passive income from a staking pool, and 50% of the collection's royalties will also go to land holders, and there will also be a token airdrop. Make sure you join our newsletter NFTs on deck to stay updated on the hottest upcoming drops and future releases in the NFT industry. And as always, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe. By now, you've likely heard the biggest story of the past week. One of the world's largest crypto exchanges, FTX, has declared bankruptcy and suddenly hundreds of millions of dollars worth of crypto was stolen from the exchange. The platform's collapse has been called a crisis on par with Enron, and the fallout from the scandal has yet to be fully revealed. With FTX's connection to hundreds of projects, including BlockFi and Yuga Labs, there's expected to be much more turmoil over the next few weeks and months. For now, NFT and crypto investors are worried about a major crypto crash, maybe similar to the 2017 crash. Stay safe out there. The fallout from FTX's collapse has already led to some welcome news. Binance will now be working to implement a new proof of reserve protocol created by the co-founder of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin. Proof of Reserve will give the world full transparency into an exchange's crypto holdings, which some are now realizing has been long overdue. While some have thought exchanges were operating safely, the recent FTX news and a new report stating that Crypto.com has 20% of their reserves in SHIB highlights the need for significantly more visibility now. Sprinting into Web3, Nike continues their journey in NFTs by releasing a new digital wearable platform called Swoosh. On Swoosh, community members can create and share digital wearables together, which can be worn in video games and other interoperable platforms. They also will offer creators tools so users can create, sell, and earn royalties without ever leaving Nike's ecosystem. The new platform is currently in beta and will begin opening up registrations later this month prior to their first drop arriving in 2023. The metaverse continues to expand, now with Forbes entering the sandbox, with a members-only event created to help usher in their customers into Web3. The Forbes event comes complete with quests, a DJ booth, an NFT gallery, and more. Unique wearables will also be sold. So as digital fashion ramps up, Forbes customers will be the first in line to flex their exclusive clothing. There's more in store for the sandbox with Forbes, so hop on in and get ready to shake hands with some virtual billionaires. OpenSea has done an about face regarding their no royalty policy and now is committed to enforcing and protecting creator royalties. As OpenSea looks to reclaim some of their lost market share taken by competitor platforms like Looks Rare and Blur, they may have found their niche appealing to creators and artists who are directly impacted by royalties. As legendary crypto artist Fuosha stated, royalties were the reason that our community flowed to NFTs in the first place, and removing royalties is backwards progress for artists. The NFT community as a whole will end up deciding the fate of creator fees, and we'll be along the whole way to keep you informed. Make sure to subscribe to Crypto Slam Clubhouse now, where we'll continue to bring you your weekly dose of the Web3 stories that matter the most.
Welcome to episode 15 of Crypto Slam Clubhouse. Huda, the clubhouse is full, right? We're not expecting anyone else right now? This is the gang today. Thanks, Paul, for showing up. Um, <laughs> love to have you and, and seeing your virtual space back there. That's that's really cool. You're from FX Hash, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, part of FX Hash uh, pretty much since the beginning, which I think is pretty much one year ago uh, to the date. Not to the date, but like pretty much. <laughs> I, I remember when FX Hash launched and Huda was making such a big deal about it. And I'm like, oh, damn, this guy, like, how does he, like, how does he know this project is legit? Like, what does he see in it? But he was just, he jumped right in. And Huda, what was that? Like, why did you know to jump right in from the beginning? Yeah, no guesswork at all. There was no, no part of me was unsure about it. It's one of those things where, like, um, I was so sure of it. I went for the first time in like my NFT trading like career, I went back and bought crypto because I was so sure about how special it was and what it would be. So I went and I bought a few thousand dollars worth of Tez. I had never done that. I didn't do it, but I, you know, I went through a couple phases of art on Tez, like Hick at Nunk, um, when that kind of was birthed. And when I started understanding that traders loved collecting like cheap art because because it was so cheap, they could afford to experiment and and try to discover new artists and they could trade with their friends and they could connect with the artists. So I understood already how special of a scene it had. But then, you know, when Hick at Nunk went away, there there really wasn't a spot to continue buying and selling and trading. And like, you know, that went away. So when FX Hash popped up, they gave everyone a place to focus on, to then look at new art, to look at something that was exciting, like generative art people were already excited about and just starting to learn more and more about. But it was those prices too that, that these pieces were dropping at a really affordable price of like sometimes one Tez, sometimes five. 20 was expensive back then. I mean, that would, that would be an expensive mint. And so, so I just pieced all those things together. Like the right community, the right product, it was just everything made sense. And then when I understood that it was created by um, by artists and, and by developers, so they knew how to make tools that, that were useful that probably nobody else was offering, I just put all those together. I'm like, this is, to me, a sure thing. If you get some artists that have some names, that's the final thing missing. And right from the start, they had artists that had great reputations in the space minting. So just just a very obvious play. And now we see a year later, happy birthday, by the way, uh, we see a year later how that played out. It's massive. That's cool. That's I, I love it when you just feel it in your bones like that, Huda. And, you know, uh, Paul, uh, what is your role there at FX Ash? Ooh, um, in the <laughs> beginning, I used to say everything non-technical. Um, because I have more like of a sort of like business traditional background in startups. Um, but really, I mean, we, we are a year old. So uh, just like a general stuff, like doing, doing doing the things that need to be done right now, that is much more like of, of the business part of things, partnerships. In the beginning, it was a little bit of marketing. Now we have, have a guy uh, that does that, who is writing amazing like uh, threads and everything. Um, so really just like the you know, business side of things in, in, in that sense. Awesome. Well, so, so you're a founder. Not, 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 not really. Um, I mean, the, the main founder of FX Hash uh, is is Cyphered. Uh, okay. Cyphered is as Huda said. Uh, he is a generative artist himself, and the really interesting thing about it, he basically coded this FX Hash in his first instant as a side project. Uh, basically, he he worked a normal nine to nine to five development job, and he wasn't he is a generative artist, so he basically looked at uh, the landscape that that was out there, and that was really only art blocks, or you could have a code basically um, your own project and then curate it and then if you don't want to drop on ETH due to like environmental reasons back then uh, then you basically just had object and you had to curate it on your own uh, so obviously there was a mismatch and then obviously not everybody not every gen artist could be allowed on our box because still there's like this curation of work so there was really a need one for artists to be able to to upload and share and create their works, but also for collectors to be able to uh, buy the work, to be able to buy uh, in cheaply, because not everybody has a thousand euros or dollars to spare to, to for an art box drop, and especially not uh, with with those gas prices. So that's really what drove Cyphered initially uh, to launch that platform. Um, and then I think he just released it like on, like as a slow release on Twitter. Uh, people from the Tesla's as well as the generative art scene found it and the first days it was just crazy no but like of course it was working but there were so many bugs and like you had to you had to wait for three days for the mint to appear and we actually 
had to close down the sites due to the sheer demand that we had. And this, ever since then, it's really, it, 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 it never really stopped. And, and that is still the reason why we have our mint cycle. So we close we close um, the platform basically for uh, for artists to to drop new 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 projects, and that came out of that need to close it because our index was too slow. Um, so really, it's like especially right now in these days, everybody's just like sharing their first wins and sharing their first stories. Of a year ago, um, I like I got a Snapchat memory of myself at like two a.m. Like oh my god, I just minted for two hours straight. What am I doing with my life? And it's just like it's just like so fun. And everybody everybody that has been in that weeks in the first weeks, they they will tell you the same thing. And um, you're just really trying to 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 still have that same feeling of community and I think we're quite succeeding with that I think um, it's it's all organic in that sense and that's one of the things that we are most proud of that yeah we, we don't need to pay for the marketing it's just people will target with word of mouth because as Huda said as beautifully said it's like it, it was just a fit it, it's still a fit and we're still artists first uh, and we want to continue being that and, and and try to shine a positive light on on the broader nft space but also basically be a beacon um for all of those um yeah other platforms and how you can interact and how you can do also business in that sense oh yeah, like what what percentage of uh volume is fx hash and art doing on tezos <laughs> Like I mean, of, of overall uh, traffic. Uh, don't don't nail me down on that, but I think art must be like 95, 90%. Really? Yeah. That is I mean, so Tezos interesting. Is, Tezos is the chain for the art. Tezos is the only chain that is at, at Art Basel. And not at Art Basel, meaning we host a satellite event, but we are at the event. We are the only ones there. And you can really see that um, in the traditional world, that if in the traditional world, it is not even a question about where the real art is. For most of the people there at the fairs, it is Tezos. Um, and it, that's a great thing because I think it's all started with Hick and Nung um, in like March of 21, where we had, um, yeah, just like artists that mostly for environmental reasons but also because they some of them couldn't afford to pay 100 dollars or 150 uh, for gas fees to mint their first nft so they had to search for a cheaper more efficient and, and faster solution and tezos was really there um and that's really one of the struggles that we at times might have where um people still have that i think that tezos is a dead chain and yes it was before he got known but that now right. it's like two years ago and yeah. things have changed things can evolve and uh, we are really proud to be to be building on tezos it's uh, basically a chain that that upgrades itself each like each three months and um yeah we're really looking forward the tech, to the, the tech underneath the hood is is very impressive yes. because I, I feel like it's a delegated proof of stake chain that was based mm -hmm. on the code base of some projects that i knew of as well too so mm -hmm. uh because they who and I've told who there's this before is like in 2020, before NFTs kind of blew up, Tezos was just known for being a place where you could stake and get yields uh mm -hmm. from the XDZ token. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden the art scene picked up with Hikat Nunk. And I guess you guys found your product market fit. It's amazing. It's just a it's a success story, really. We found it on the first day in that sense. And and, and that's what's really crazy. Uh, and now we just want to of course expand and um yeah, just like make 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 generative art accessible to to more people. I think that is really our sort of broader. But how goal. did you guys get the community, Paul? Like how did how did the artists <laughs> you know, like how did that start and and you know, like what snowballed there? I think it was basically it was a community in the beginning of enthusiasts. So the artists already were on Tezos in, initially in the beginning, and artists have inherently different values than collectors. They do care about quality of work. They don't care as much about pricing. They they don't uh, they they are not coming in with this profit maximization mindset. And if in the early days of our Discord, 50% of the people were really traditional, uh, or like old Tezos and also old ETH collectors that are there for the art. And then the artists also being there and really guiding and creating the community. And if the first 100, 200, 300, 400 people all have the same shared mindset about what you want to create, how you want to interact, how you 
should drop something, how you get feedback, how you react to to certain like market things happening, um, then that can sort of like get uh, basically gets teach to the new people coming into the space. I didn't wasn't as active in Discord before before I joined Epic Hash, um, and sort of like I learned those community values that ethos in that sense from them, and that is still happening. Of course, we also have flippers. Of course, we also have drama, but our own basically our status quo to drama is let's try to calm down let's not let's not push oh you it. said drama i thought you said grandma okay no right. drama no, no, i was like no, wow no, that's no, a cool no, person pers- uh, no, audience no, no, to no. have you know but... no 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 i, I mean we're on nft crypto right i mean just look at what happens today every <laughs> everybody there's drama drama everywhere but it also it's how you react and 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 really we we have a set of shared values um, that are again predominantly built upon those artist values, and I think just if you just go with artists and trust their judgment on these things, then uh, you will be you will be better in the end. And and we are seeing that, um, and especially with this word of mouth marketing in that sense that we get, um, it's mostly hey, this is the first community I felt at home. Um, because it's not, hey, we need to pump up those floor numbers and uh, dealers, 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 but really is, I'm buying this because I like the art and that's yeah. it. There's no, there's no utility. There's no nothing. I mean, the biggest utility is this one right here. You can hang it up in your virtual Zoom back and, and, and that's about it. And and if, if everybody agrees that that is why we're here, then everybody is better off. Um, so really, yeah. And really, too, I I think the price was probably, I think the biggest factor, I'll say at least for me, because when I started minting on FX Hash, to be honest, I still didn't really, really understand generative art. I knew I liked it, but I didn't understand the process, how it was made. I didn't understand exactly what people valued about it. Now, I had a taste of it back on Hick at Nunk, and and like the first time it kind of clicked for me was minting a... um, uh, I'm going to say his name wrong, but Schwembler. I don't know if I say the name right, but yeah. I sat there with the pieces and I clicked. I clicked over and over and over and over thousands and thousands of times obsessively. And then every so often you hit a really cool, like a rare output. And the euphoria you get when you hit one of those, because it, it's so exciting and fresh and different, it stands out. So that was the little bit I had understood about generative art back then. But the prices on FX hash being one Tez or whatever to mint meant, meant I could go experiment and I could go learn at not a big cost to myself. And that's what got me, that's what got me there and kept me hooked. So I could keep buying, keep minting, keep learning the generative art process till we I got to the point I'm at today where I have a pretty darn good understanding of what it is and how it's made and all that stuff. So the price, I think, was about the most important thing to get the collectors in. Uh, that's completely true. You 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 need to try it out yourself. You need to immerse yourself in, in doing that. And you and, and that's the thing again with with Artblocks is an amazing platform in itself. But for a lot of people that if you're not early early ETH investor or through some other luck have that bankroll, like you can't try it out. Yes, you can look at it. Yes, you can. Oh, that's a nice output. But you have to do it. You have you have to, you have to have some. How do you say? Yeah, you have to have some. Um, money in the game in that sense and yeah if, if you if you can just like try it out and try it out at cheap prices then it's also okay to be wrong because if one mint is just five dollars in that sense it's okay to be wrong uh, but if one mint is five hundred dollars then 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 for some people it is not wrong and really like making the art more accessible is, 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 is again like one of our principles everybody likes art everybody likes to go to not i mean not everybody but most of the people like to go to museums but not not most of to people can can um, yeah collect art and and that really was one of our principles as well um nowadays we we try to urge the artists to raise their prices because they are just worth that but it's really like a slow sort of like process um and we're slowly getting there we also have like, uh, quite fun stories about that when we when we try to like and Sif, uh, tried to increase uh his uh, like the prices overall um i think we I think Huda, you mentioned it, 20 tests at the time was a really expensive mint. Um, but the cipher was like, hey, like the quality of the art, it's just worth more than 20, 20 tests. Like I want to change that. So he created a project and basically made like a manual Dutch auction uh, that because back then we didn't have the automated Dutch auction. And he basically set the starting price at 100 just to set an example, basically, hey, 
I'm starting at 100. It will end at 10. I don't care. I'm starting at 100. And then in the first 10 minutes, it sold all at 100. <laughs> and that really showed, showed the artists that, hey, the collector base, they appreciate not only the art, but they also grasp the concept of the value of it. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's always has been sort of like this um, sort of like conversation between artists and collectors. And um, yeah, it's just like a really open um open open field to discuss for all of the parties involved and i think that's great mm. so just a quick comment even about your dutch auction like kind of mm. drop styles where we we launched here at crypto slam we dropped mm. we we released our own marketplace called dropping now that is only dutch auctions and mm. well I even it maybe maybe I at first and some others felt that Dutch auctions that's it can be a hard sell for collectors, you know, like that it might not be the preferred style because of the success of that style on FX hash. That was the first thing I pointed to. And I made sure mm -hmm. people I said, look over there, it works on all of these drops, and collectors will eventually understand that drop mechanic. And and they do. And 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 you can look at FX hash very specifically to see it playing out that way. It works. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it all be, basically Dutch auctions um, maximize the amount of maximize the primary proceeds for the artists, mm -hmm. and we are artists first, so that is really important to us. Yes, the secondary in that sense won't have that big, uh, won't have that big volume initially, or on average will not have that big basically price point because, for example, you have a project, this inherent value of it is valued at two hundred tests. Either way, you what, what happened in previously, artists released it for 20 tasks, and then basically, like the the, the, the secondary market will correct it. The the early purchases will basically make up the 180 tasks difference, and they're happy. The artist is sort of also happy because he sold out. His like project is really flourishing on secondary, getting a lot of like mind share. Um, but ultimately, the artist makes less money. Um, Dutch auctions sort of flip that. Then of course the collectors might not be, I mean, they're still happy or like most of them are happy, but the flipper collectors might not be as happy because it's not as like on secondary. It's always a trade-off, but um, it comes in cycles basically. And um, a really good, well, well timed uh, Dutch auction and with like really good pricing tiers uh, is fast at least um, the best thing because you can have both like the good secondary uh, action but then also uh, maximizing the artist proceeds because that's in essence what we're after because before before uh, fix hash not a lot of artists could make a living uh, through their artworks and that's a thing that a lot of people um yeah, need to need to understand that it's like actual human beings on the other side um and these are artists and and they yeah, it took, yeah it's uh, just amazing to see them make a living off this yeah yeah it has been life-changing for more than a few of the artists uh, again i'm really bad with names but the um the creator of waiting in afton it's a perfect yeah and, and, and they lindo yes it, yeah, exactly it, right he yeah, was he, able to leave his job and and I think move to art full time after his success that he's had on the platform. Really yes, awesome. And, yes, that's. Uh, I think he, he's also a fun story because he initially um, wanted to basically submit it to Art Blocks, didn't get there, and then just started releasing his stuff on FX Hash and and every, like the community just like gobbled it up because it's wow. it's it, he's he's it's such good. a great it's, artist. Yeah. Yes, and 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 um and and really that's that that's this beauty of this non curated, totally open space. Everybody, you can be a beginner, you can drop on Netflix. Actually, you can be an intermediary, you can drop. You will have one or two really good projects. If you're a pro, also have fun. Like there, there's no difference in the end. Um, and 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 sort of like this, this is a tool. Basically, we think of ourselves as just like journalists of art, layer one. People can use us. And that's about it. We will not market you. Um, it's it's really it's a tool for collectors and artists to use in that sense. It's like a big laboratory too, as well. Like I mean, some of the links, Huda, some of the links that you drop me are, are are really ugly. Like I'm not gonna lie. Like some of these, you know, but some of them are nice. Some of them are like, wow, those are those are great. And it's like, here's this here's this set of collectors, and you know, I say it's ugly, but obviously, art is obviously subjective, right? And it it has that's the the point of it. It's like I could think it's ugly, but then Huda thinks it's amazing and 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 buys it all. Um, but that's the thing that's great about Tezos is that the the gas costs are there's very minimal and everything's just 
just a lot more um, reasonable, I guess you'd say, for the for the artist community to, to proliferate and experiment, which is, I think, is the biggest thing that you guys need. Yep. Yes, and 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 that's where um, that really is the key experimentation. As we again, we have no curation, so the artists can live out their wildest dreams. They can just yeah. try out different things. And as an artist, that if if you're getting constrained because you might think that there's a curation board and that curation board has a like opinion of things or like has a certain style that they like, right. and even subconsciously, you as an artist will alter your style in some kind of way. You will not express in the same ways that you might have that you might would do if 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 you have no constraints in that sense and that really i think helps push some artists to make amazing and great projects that otherwise would have not been um possible um justin i'll give you a chance to ask a question yeah sure um so i was looking <laughs> through the website i've just been kind of geeking out with the conversation i'm new to generative mm -hmm. art kind of like why mm -hmm. um and to be honest, I don't know what's good. I like a lot of things, uh, but I will say like, so in looking at the website, I noticed you all have a whole documentation section that outlines, mm -hmm. you know, artist guides and you talk about the collaboration side. And it mm -hmm. almost seems like a very, um, it's very beginner friendly, like for someone who might be just getting into uh, artists cool. are getting into generative art per se and wants to like know the how to's but at the same time as an artist yes as an artist yes we have great documentation for artists as a collector I think it can be quite hard and that's something that we need to be better at because it's it's just a lot if you're a crypto native then I think it's rather easy you just load up some tasks on your wallet and, and then what I always say to people really is is like get I mean at least especially right now like get fifty dollars worth worth of tasks and then just buy 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 what you like and and after you've burned through like your stack and it will happen sooner rather than later because it becomes addictive then you will already have sort of like this the start of your first taste and you will see okay 20 percent of it like what why did i even buy it and then maybe 20 percent. oh my god absolutely love it and then then slowly but surely you'll acquire your taste um but yeah for, again we're like in the beginning and platform we always said platform made by artists for artists so really we wanted to get people to to make it easy to uh, to make it easy to drop and also the community has created a lot of amazing guidelines even for people um that can't code we have boilerplates we have uh, also something um just like a pure spider template where you can create a lot of pfps with it which is something we i mean we, we say we are a gentle art platform we never imagined people to use our minting technology for their pfp projects uh but they did and they did so many of them that we actually had to uh, like create a new sales sales feed for it so really we also don't know where we are heading at and in, in, in that sense and we're just open for new ideas and uh, Mm. I, what, what advice do you have for uh, both collectors and artists who are um, more native to the traditional side of things, but are now looking at NFTs, looking at generative art and looking to make their entrance? You mean traditional as in traditional artists, non-crypto, just like... Non-crypto native, yeah. I mean, there, it, it really depends. The interesting thing about generative art in itself is that it gives the artist um, a control over randomness. Control over randomness is something that traditional artists don't have, but artists have been trying to get basically ever since art existed. There's a myriad of books and and stories about artists tr trying to recreate randomness. So, but but not everything, not every artistic practice works for FX hash or works for generative art. So first of all, if you like us, you should see if your artistic practices actually work on it. And then if if it makes sense for you, then really it's about reading through the documentations, but also reading through for, or listening to, for example, um, our Art Basel speaker series that we had that really goes over what is generative art, what is this cultural phenomenon. Um, and then really, again, just trying it out joining the discord and asking questions because we have a lot of people within uh, our our community that are artists first and that that, that are that, that really just are about explaining explaining it to people really making it beginner friendly um and then there's also like a lot of like youtube um 
resources, for example, da Daniel Schiffman is basically um, an amazing um, at the coding train. It's like a channel name. It's an amazing resource to get started with P5.js. I did it as well. I'm, again, in the beginning, I said I'm not technical. I still managed to uh, create a project because it's, um, it's, it's not that hard in that sense. Uh, you just have to um, yeah, take a little bit of time out of your day and just try to create. What what kind of art isn't suited for gen art? Like, is there a specific like genre it's, or it, not really? It's much more. I mean, theoret. So, for example, performance art gets really right. hard to make it yeah. generative. We have some like I'm. We we have been talking, for example, uh, operator who are doing at, at times amazing performance jobs. How you can implement it? You you can do it, but it gets complicated. It, it's it's not as easy as just coding something up because performance art in, inherently is often made with the body in itself. So how do you how do you codify that? What do you need to do? So that's what I mean with not every art makes sense i mean if but it can and it's also that's the difference generative art or like it's not as easy as just like hey i have made a piece of art something i i on a canvas i don't know i make a picture of it i upload it as an nft yes you can do that on different platforms but not on fx hash because you actually need to use the randomness and you and, and that's why not everything makes sense yes you can for example work on it and, and and basically digitize your style of drawing your style of coloring and then make a gen art project out of it that makes sense or you work with a coder who tries to do that for you we have also seen that a lot of um, artists just collaborating with developers who are native to fx hash who are native to p5j p5js or processing which are what's what some of the um, languages that are getting used on fx um to create a project. So theoretically, you can pretty much make everything into a gen art project. Question is if it makes sense doing gen art for the sake of doing gen art. Not sure, but I mean, we have seen a lot of interesting stuff. We have AI and not just mid journey, but like really GAN models with like Ivona Tau, for example, who is doing an amazing job. We have um, poetry as well, generative mm. poetry. Um, Sasha Styles is one of the people to to do it and to, to do it in a really amazing uh, way, and she she's also getting a lot of traction and success uh, for that. Um, so a lot of things can work, not all should maybe work. Um, but if 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 you want to, you will find a way to drop on FX hash. I think. You know, Huda, I I, I didn't get that randomness was a coveted part of uh, art. I didn't think that that was uh, something that artists were trying to achieve. Uh, could you go elaborate a little bit more into that? Like, what is the history behind that? Like, wh why is that important, the randomness factor? Question to me? Well, well I guess to, to Huda. No, Huda, Huda, you can start in the now. Yeah, I mean, I don't know... I don't know if it is important. I just know that it is certainly exciting. Um, and, and we know that there's so much there's so much proof of that because we see that on Ethereum with just even those profile pictures. When you get lucky and you mint, you know, the rarest of the bunch, well, there's some value that comes with it. It's exciting that it stands out from the rest of the collection. And that does apply to art with, you know, all of these projects. If you happen to get one that is a unique set of colors, it's got a, a unique pattern, something like that. There's just a little something extra that comes with that because, again, it is it is different in, in this like sea of of kind of a collection with all of these pictures that have a, a, a thread between them all. You've got some that really stand out in that collection, and, and it's exciting to be the one that might own that piece in the collection. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's uh, necessary, you know, like if they're all pretty similar across the board, I'm happy so to it, own just a piece of the collection. I, I, just I, I, would, I would differ. I, I would say something differently, just to be told. What Huda is speaking about is rarity, basically rarity of your piece. And yes, that is important, especially in a PFP context. In the art context, not as much, but it's much more, uh, and maybe I misspoke earlier, but I, uh, basically the what what is exciting for or what has been exciting for a lot of artists is the choice of controlled randomness you basically as an artist you or like as a traditional artist there's no way for you to if, if you draw for example a flower like wherever you put your wherever you put your uh your um how do you say not not pencil or whatever whatever the thing is called brush. to like to brush yes exactly so, sorry uh, wherever you put the brush to like start on your flower that's where the flower is 
it doesn't matter if it's like five centimeters to the right, to the right, to the left, up or down. Like you don't, you don't have, you basically have to choose as an artist within generative art, within the code world. You, you don't necessarily have to, but you can think of, hey, this, this like it might make sense in the overall composition of the picture to have it somewhere upper right corner, but you don't quite know. Maybe maybe it's also in the left hand corner, maybe there should be two in the right hand, but only one in the left. And that really gives the artist so much more potential to, 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 to make a composition that they don't have in, in the non-code world in that sense. Yes, you can maybe, like splatter paint on um on like a canvas and that is then also at times right. randomness um because you can't uh because you can't influence the way like the, the paint uh, the paint drops uh, are like flying but that's really the only sort of like randomness that there is to it within code you can basically um utilize that randomness much more and that's i think what is exciting especially for um for artists that are also technologically skilled and are really good software engineers in that sense um to really play around with that um i feel like it's just such a insane challenge you, you have all these technical is, tools is. but to make it look good you know like uh to make something pleasant to the eye that's totally generative is is definitely a skill so yes, that's, that's the definition why it's of a art. skill yeah yes that that's why it's art that's why it's so exciting and then um that's why also we i, I really think and also most of uh, basically everybody from all of the fx hash team also thinks that generative art is one of the next big art evolutions that that will happen because it perfectly summarizes everything we do every our world is dominated by tech and code and most of it or not most of it but some of it is also um but do you not see like the irony of going to art basil and and try and saying like to all these artists now you have to learn the code isn't that crazy like no no but it's no it's a it's a new subsection it's oh it's, it's just should, a, it's just it, a niche in there Yes, it's a niche. It's the same as with photography. When 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 the technology of photo of photography started, then people made art with that. When the technology yeah. of video started, people Good made point. video art. It's yeah. it's a new technology that enables a new set of artists, and especially will enable um, a new group of artists that are not technically uh, that are not technically trained to be an artist, or that basically have the money to get a traditional art education. If you want to be a generative artist, all you really need is a device that can run a code. If you want to be a traditional artist, um, uh, no, I said, yeah, if you want to be a traditional artist, you basically uh, need like, a lot of luck or highly influential or or, or or parents that are well off that, that can fund you with that. And that really, again, um, pushes down a lot of boundaries and enables people to create, to share, um, and that is really why, why why this is so important and because it's a perfect use case of the blockchain technology yeah. in that sense. Um, From a distribution and sales and, and royalties point of view, yeah. Yes, and I mean, we are actively using uh, the technology. So what happens when you mint uh, on FX hash is you, each transaction has a hash. A hash is a really long unique number that can't be replicated. Um, and we are using that hash number of, of your, when you click mint, basically a transaction occurs on a Tesla's blockchain, that transaction has a hash and we are going to use that hash to see the randomness of the algorithm. So then each time the algorithm runs or each time someone buys a new transaction occurs, a new hash occurs, and that hash basically will only originate the, the 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 artwork so really it's also um at our recent installation at in, in paris we basically said this is similar to commissioning a work by an artist because yes the artist created and crafted the, the algorithm but ultimately you had the one to finish it or to to supplement the last final step to it um and that for example is different than just um basically rolling the dice uh on 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 like 30 different character traits and then calling it a pfp and that's really why generative art is, art in our opinion is uh one of the better use cases we have right now uh for art uh, or like for art on the blockchain in that sense very cool um i i want to switch gears i want to talk about what you talked and that you hinted about at the beginning of this interview which was utility. And you said that <laughs> you said that that's all the utility you need is just hanging that uh, picture right. Up. And I, and I, I get that. I got that 
ever since I bought my first uh, metaverse properties in in the voxels uh, community. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I totally get it. So where do you see um, that technology heading? And do you foresee like who just hosted a, a large event uh, with the crypto bats community um, in Decentraland? Who did, mm-hmm. did you see art hanging up around? Did you see posters up there in, in the virtual space? Like, um, tell me about your experience in these virtual spaces. Yeah, I mean, for me, for yesterday, there no, I didn't really see art. There were banners, you know, like not quite advertisements, but band names and whatnot, but no art. But that does exist. I know a lot of people who have an art focus that are, you know, running around Decentraland. So it is there, but just not, not really part of that event yesterday. Okay. But in... Do you do you think it's a stretch for everyone to see like virtual galleries as a thing? Yes. Is it as to, to me? Yes. I mean, virtual galleries can be interesting. Um, they have a use case, and they will have a use case that I can't imagine right now, probably. Um, but just because the art is digital doesn't mean that you can only exhibit it digitally there are and and we're still ex- for example re- recently i saw a really interesting um installation happening in a gallery basically you would have five five screens and the, the really important thing if, if you work in a gallery and, and work with screens and digital art make sure that your screens are good you need 4k screens otherwise it will not look good the experience will, will be shitty make sure to get good screens rather get one good screen than three shitty screens like i tell you that that's like the, one of the more important things but basically what happens is instead of the artist showcasing selected outputs he had they had five screens running simultaneously and every 45 seconds, a new iteration of the algorithm would run, and thus a new artwork would be shown only for 45 seconds, and then to disappear and never come again. And oh, wow. Did, yes, and, and that experience, you're basically looking at five screens, you, you're, you're seeing that the art, like the artwork shown all are, are similar, but distinctively different. And then that as an experience is something that Yes, it can also be replicated digitally and virtually, but to see that in person uh, must have been really amazing. So, um, yes, the art is digital, but that is because this is art done with code. So it is inherently digital. You can, of course, if it's a, a static piece, you can still plot it or print it. And I mean, don't don't get me into plotters. That's a whole whole another whole another thing where I can talk like thirty minutes about. Um, just because, but like my main point is just because the art is digital doesn't mean that you can only enjoy it digitally that's the sort of like status quo and the main way to enjoy it but yeah fair enough so i guess you you answered my question even better because i i feel like the utility of the piece you buy that digital piece and the utility of it is obviously displaying it and you just mentioned there could be plotters and printing like i've printed out a few mm-hmm. blocks pizza back, mm-hmm. pieces back there and mm-hmm. uh, but I could also display that into a virtual gallery and I could also put it up on the screen as well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like the utility is just off the charts, really, uh, when you think about it. And and with the technology that develops in the future, you see infinite objects has like a little uh, yeah. thing there. And, you know, in 10 years from now, who knows? It could be just uh, I've heard that who do you're into this, but like AR, maybe oh, there's yeah. there's utility there too right for sure yeah i'd love to see like 3d objects in ar in my living room even things like vivi already let you hang up like collectible like posters and comics and stuff on your walls so like displaying your art via ar is is it's here already but it's coming in a much bigger way down the road i'm excited for that yeah wow yes and i mean i mean utility what is the utility if you have a picasso you can look at it and you can sell it and that's about it and with with the crypto space sort of like a lot of has been interpreted and or interpreted into what utility does your nft have and for pfp projects i sort of get it because you're part of a community so it should be the community should give you something but you really have to understand that there is a difference between uh, generative art or crypto art in general and pfps yes pfps can look nice and can be considered art but it's something completely different and you can't ha- hold these two to the same standards when comparing um and i, I think we're slowly getting there uh but it, it, it takes some time paul are we headed towards like 
the season of, I guess, generative audio. Are we getting closer to that phase? It's something I've been looking forward to for a long, long time. And I think we've seen some, well, actually right behind me, a really incredible, ah, Tukata. Really incredible yeah, no, piece that, does, that, that, you know, it has audio in it. it you know, it, I need more of that though. I've been waiting for that. It hasn't really come yet where, where just there's a huge, huge rush of, of new audio pieces, but I feel like it's close. Uh, problem is it's really fucking hard. Like re it's, it is really hard there. There are some pieces we are getting there um yes more 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 will come i think what's hard um, about like, it obviously to to make it sound the, the sound of it is the sound of it is hard to, uh, like again like i'm not technically i'm also not an artist um but from a, what i've understood is really making the like music and it sounds like really like harmonic and yeah. getting that done with uh just with code really really hard we slowly but surely getting there um, but it's just, I think it's basically in, in, in its, how do you say, in its difficulty, it's basically gen art squared. So <laughs> because you need to be a good artist, you need to be a good musician, you need, you need to understand all of that, and then you actually need to code it. And then what makes it really hard is this generative aspect, because music only works if, like, um, like again, these like um, interdependencies of of the specific notes make sense. And if you then incorporate randomness to it, and then it's just like one tick off, then the whole thing will be off because it doesn't flow anymore. So there, really, that that's I think one of the issues. There are some artists that have done something before. Also, I think that actually the first piece I minted on FX Hash was a sound piece, um, but it's really, um, it's much more basic, much more bass heavy in that sense, um, similar to a little bit techno-ish, but not EDM, but like really like, um, how do you say, uh, not equalizers, uh, but like it's a synth and like high pitched and it's getting there, but uh, probably takes some time. Uh, but as Huda said, or as Huda has in his background, we have some amazing projects. And I think that's, that's also like one of the more successful projects out there on FX hash. Um, it's like, uh, Huda, have you ever heard anyone play the piano live uh, and, and they hit a wrong note? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, like you know, that's 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 what you're trying to stop, I guess. Yes, like, and, and, yeah. and the the thing is, you don't even you don't know what the next note should be, but you know that if somebody plays one wrong note, you'll immediately know it. Yeah, and that and that and that's a, and that, that's a problem there. Where if you then enforce or like con enforce randomness on this, then there's the probability that a wrong note will be played is just so much higher, and that that's really. Um, where 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 well where it's harder, but there are some there are there are some amazing pieces out there. We're slowly getting there. Cool. Well, guys, do you guys have any uh, questions that you guys want to ask, Paul? Yeah, probably endlessly. But really, <laughs> how big and how grand? Like, what is generative art going to look like in five years? Like, how robust are these pieces going to start becoming? Like, when I when I look at even just the first weeks of FX Hash, there was a lot of you know a little more basic pieces. There were, of course, some mm -hmm. some stunning, you know, very elaborate things, but they don't really quite compare to again this one in the background mm -hmm. and other things we've been seeing the past you know few months mm -hmm. on FX Hash. And, and if I just think that it keeps growing exponentially, I can't like what what are we going to see in a few years? I can't fathom it really. Um, me neither. All I know <laughs> is I'm really excited for it. Uh, and yes, we're seeing an increase of quality of projects because um, again, the, the 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 interesting thing is for traditional artists, if you would copy the uh, an uh, other artist, you would actually have to see it in person. Then you would have to like sit down, try to like emulate all of it. But if you, as a coder, you can basically peek inside the code. You can see what are the guy, what what is the person, what what is the artist doing, um, and you can basically copy paste it. And then, I mean, you don't copy paste it into your code and then say hey. Uh, but you can you can you can you can look at the techniques and you can learn much faster. And that's I think what we're seeing right now uh, playing out that the, it, the the speed of iteration and the speed where artists can learn from each other is a magnitude a magnitude higher than uh, what we're seeing in the traditional art world. Um, so really, I don't know where we'll be going. All I know is we are in for a good ride. <laughs> I'm with you there. Yep, yep. Yeah. I can't wait.
Then, then would you mind also giving a quick comment on the um, like a, a newer phase of FX hash, which is the articles? I think it's called FX. Mm, is yes, it text FX, or text, or FX, FX yeah. text. Yes, FX text. Um, yeah. So basically, what we what we have seen is that um, artists have been lacking a tool to write about their to, to give background on their pieces. Um, what we have seen is a lot of artists previously did Twitter threads, but Twitter threads are nice. For the moment of minting and then they're forgotten because nobody is on twitter like typing hey i want to know more about this project like if you're already following the artist it makes sense then some people did like their own website which also is nice but again it links out not everybody sees it um so we really thought we wanted to do like a web3 native publishing platform um that is tezos native and 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 that really was the initial idea about it. We, truth to be told, we again we released it as this sort of like um, uh, just like normal text style editor. We thought, okay, some artists will write about their the, the, the projects. Maybe someone will do a write up about the product, like the collector or curator will do a write up about their project. Who we're seeing now really um, sort of like um, is, is bigger than what we imagined. We have people using it as their link tree. We have people uh, supplementing their own podcasts to it and making a visual guide for the podcast as well. Um, we have people in the beginning, somebody used it uh, as a press release for their DeFi platform. Like it's, it, it, wow. um, it's, it's, bas it's basically just um, a Tezos native um, text editor that where you can also like in, in embed a lot of things. Um, and really, we, we really just thought it's like a small missing piece from the equation to again also educate the, educate, uh, the collectors about the art because um, as we both said in the beginning, not everybody from us knows everything about generative art and it is okay to not know. But you basically just need to give people the opportunity to learn, to learn on their own. And yes, panel discussions can be nice, but these are always just in the moment. Enabling artists to to to, to link um, write-ups to their art, everybody can then basically enjoy it in an async way. Uh, and that really, in our opinion, is the way how we onboard the next thousand, ten thousand, and then subsequently, hopefully, uh, the broader population uh, to the spectrum to. I guess yeah, um, we'll end on the fact that, you know, this crypto art movement is uh, solving one of the biggest issues in art, which was always forgeries and being also able to uh, provide a living for the artists. So, I mean, anything um, that builds on that and obviously the creativity of the community is just ice cream on or, or a cherry on top of the ice cream but like those two s solutions have been solved by blockchain and, and congrats to the your team paul and uh mm -hmm. just for the the rabid community of of artists that you have there they're definitely mm -hmm. doing um great work so yes. thank you for joining yes. us and and yeah, let us always. know where we can catch up with you guys I mean, you can catch up with us uh, during our Basel Miami. I think that, I think that will. Nice. So that's I think in two weeks we'll again have like a big booth. If you don't have a te Tezos wallet, it doesn't matter. We we have like live minting. We'll get you a new Tezos wallet. You get a piece from one of our amazing artists for free, of course. Um, yeah, so you can catch or like meet basically the whole FX, FX hash team there, um, and and see it in action. Nice. I'll be at our Basel Miami. So really, yeah, come by. I was just going to say, Justin is the only one that doesn't have a Tezos wallet on this panel here right now. So it's. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, solve, we'll solve that issue. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I'll onboard you happily. Like, uh, okay. I look forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, cool. Paul. And, uh, and, yeah, uh, also, thank you for having me. I thank mean. you, Paul. Yeah, thanks <laughs> for recording. Yeah. We, we always have like these things at the end where, you know, we yeah. have some good Paul, takes. Um, yeah, what one thing for sure I wanted to just mention, there is the um the one year anniversary is I think officially next week for FX hash or right? Uh, I mean here's all I officially know. officially was last week, but we we're celebrating next week. <laughs> that's it. And that's it. It's the event. It's something that I have missed so much. And I talk about this actually often is those incredible events that would happen kind of across Twitter, but in the Tezos community, like mm -hmm. object for object. Everybody mm -hmm. in the Tezos space on Twitter putting that hashtag object for object, putting out free mints, putting out cheap mints, just a way to like kind of for the artists to show love and for the collectors to show love back and to just enjoy collecting. 
And mm -hmm. I feel like you captured that spirit with this thing coming next week, which I don't know the name officially of the event, but I saw it's it's like one Tez Mint's 365 mm -hmm. editions. I will be yes. all over that. Yeah, I think the official name sort of is FX hash turns one. Uh, I mean, yes. it's, it, it, it doesn't flow as nicely as object for object, for example. Uh, but I mean, that pretty much tells the stories, right? We are we are turning one year old. We sort of like want to um, give back. And also what is important, also uh, use sort of like the position that we are in to also put a spotlight uh, on, on some of the world happening. So what we are saying is basically release a project for one task, 365 editions. And if you can donate, um, what the proceeds either partially or some of them we also have that actually on chain so you can pretty much in the mint flow you can like donate to pakistan like to iran like all of and, of, and also the processing foundation which is also really uh, a really important part of the whole gent of art world um so basically um, enjoy the art give back uh, both to the collectors but also to the broader world um, and the interesting thing is you can already see the projects in the pipeline and damn i'm excited to like basically i want to collect all of them but i'm not sure if, if that will work out um are they showing up in the explorer right now or are they showing yes, up in, in, the, in, in, oh, in yeah. the in the incoming tab you can already see uh, you can already see some of them and um yeah they're they're really nice so like excited excited for that and then uh, i think the whole week uh, well, when we is our puzzle uh starts on the 29th of november i oh. think man i've got to get to these no you should you should is it, and, is it, it's and, in like, miami it's it's always in it, miami no so art basel is originally in basel the fair started oh, there gotcha. and then there's four or uh, three other iterations one is in hong kong one is in Paris, uh, or one, the, the first iteration was held this year in Paris, and then in Miami. Um, funny thing is, our first, um, and, and that's basically sort of like the, uh, one, one of the biggest things for galleries to be at, is to be at Art Basel, and our first official showing actually was at Art Basel Hong Kong, uh, five yeah. months after we started, that, that was, um, like I, I still can't fathom it um also like i always wanted to be at that bar just to like be there and look at the art uh, and now suddenly like i'm an exhibitor there um and not not at me personally but like the, the FX team hash, of fx yeah. hash in that sense um it's it's really cool and and um and like what I mentioned in the beginning, we are really the only ones doing something with NFTs, Journal of Art there. And um, cool. you, you can see in Basel, there were still some questions about, hey, what, what is a blockchain? What is NFT? Then in Paris, it was like, hey, okay, I know what a blockchain is. I know what an NFT is. I, some of them already knew Gen Art. So the people are slowly starting to understand it, and especially the institutionals like museums, galleries. Um, they are understanding it, grasping it. Um, and for me, like there's no way this is not uh, going to work out with with the conversations that we're having at 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 at, at our booth in that sense. And come by in Miami, like the the artists that we that we will have this time are amazing. I can't tell them yet. Um, but uh, I'm sure so, you don't want to miss out. Is our art blocks doesn't show up at Art Basel? No, no, interesting. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Paul. Uh, okay. Pace Gallery. To totally. Does, I think. What was that? that? Pace Gallery does, and they're working with art blocks. Oh. But in Paris, they had, I think, just one screen, and yeah, like it's uh, it's it's not a focus for Pace. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I won't make a comment, right. but because we super, might use it. Super, clip, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Re really speculative question. This is just something I've been kind of thinking about for a while now. Do you foresee the day where there's like um, Tezos artworks at Christie's, like Christie's auction house? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you, dude. I've been thinking of this for a long, long while. It's why I collect some of the things I do. And I got really excited like two weeks ago or so. I saw a tweet that there was like some kind of like educational event at Christie's. I don't remember what it was called. I don't know the focus of it. Uh, but I, it I think Sasha Styles was there. Yes, yes. Yeah, and that was again, it. That was exactly Tezos. It. Tezos and I, I, I'm like a, I'm like a, like a video stuck on loop. Like Tezos really It's almost tries. like you work for FX Ash, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Crazy, <laughs> right? No, but, 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 but Tezos really tries to position itself to be the chain for the art world and we in this crypto bubble might not realize that if you're not subjected to it but the art world realizes that and 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 that's in the end where where, where the big things are coming from and these 
we are in the process of it. Um, I mean, I, I know personally as well a few uh, people working at Sotheby's, for example, that are already collecting um, and that oh, already wow. are yes, and um, it's it's going it's going to happen, and you can uh, you can just either like hop in on the right or <laughs> look look on the are outside, you in the, the outside are you in the tender Discord? Yes. Okay. So what is the background? I, I should have asked this too. Is like, what is the background of Seifert uh, and his relations to the the tender? Uh... Um, yeah, yeah I, I can go into that. So basically, um, you know that FX hash obviously no curation, meaning there's coming a lot of projects coming in. I don't know all of the projects um, and nobody else can as well. So there was obviously this huge for curation, but we as FX hash as the platform always said, we don't want to be the player deciding what's good, what's bad. We are the provider of tools. So tender pretty much originated out of this cohort of people from the first weeks in FX hash where there are like generative art enthusiast people with also like a traditional art career traditional art background that can also like look at it from a like sophisticated point of view so what they went out to do is basically create a platform and, and I mentioned that the in, in the uh, in, in the beginning where that we see FX hash as this layer one and uh, we are completely open everybody can access everything the APIs and tender builds on top tender is a curational layer for FX hash, where um, the tender team, the curational team of tender picks what is good, what is not good, and basically does a pre selection. And we are really proud to have tender because tender is an integral part um, for new people joining. It's an integral part, especially for traditional collectors joining, especially for people from the ETH space joining that sort of like want to take a leap into Tezos. But obviously, if you look at our uh, explore page, it's just too much in that sense. You can't go through it on your own. And basically, you get a and and a smooth onboarding experience, and that's really where Tender is coming from. So we are not affiliated with them in, in a way where they are like an entity of ours. Not at all. It's a completely separate entity. Um, we are working with them because they provide a great service. Um, but we also, for example, we recently we saw. Um, or we're seeing also different people or also sometimes brands starting the same layer on top of mm -hmm. uh, FX hash. So for example, pr British audio brand CAF recently um, also launched something um, on FX hash and they also want to be sort of like uh, audio generative layer on top of FX hash. Again, we, they basically came inbound and basically said, hey, we love what you guys are doing. We're just going to drop it on, on your platform. And they didn't even let us know in advance. Basically three days before they were like, hey, uh, let's do something um so that's it, it's quite interesting and we just hope that there will be more tenders and more people building on top and more people educating um so yeah that's sort of like where uh, where this is coming from cool thank you for that oh, well, oh I, okay i promise it'll be my last question promise it's <laughs> fine more important nft on the platform uh rgb or the oh generative logo um I mean, more important in that sense, RGB, because it's made, I mean, both of them are made by Cypher, uh, but I think the RGBs just have like more, more to it. Everybody can sort of like connect with it. It's like a good analogy to that is the RGBs are the chromy squiggles of FX hash. Yeah. And I think that that really, it, it, it just makes a lot of sense. Like Snowfro created the squiggles, Cypher created RGBs. It's like uh, the early people who have been there we are able to mint it for pretty much nothing. I mean, at least uh, the RGBs were zero test in the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think the mo most, uh, I actually thought you would ask what's more important, RGBs or Garden Monolith from Zankan. Oh, um, well, I yeah. thought that's what he was going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the, so the generative saying. logo is, is the first token minted on the platform. I know I didn't know he made that one. So that's actually that's no, a, no, something no, extra it's, it's interesting. Made, it's, it's made by him as well. But I think I actually wow. read that on Twitter recently that also the squiggles are not the first mint. Like the first mint is a different project as well. So it, I mean, the an analogy is it just like keeps on going. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I like I like truth to be told, I don't like to me the FX dash logos are undervalued. But I mean, yes. Hey, Paul, yeah. if you know any uh, coders or um, FX hash enthusiasts uh, that would be a tutor, 
I'll pay them. I want to learn the technology, but I just don't have the time to learn it all myself. But I'll, I'll pay them. Really, really, really um, go on YouTube. Oh, the okay. Coding Train by Daniel Schiffman. He explains to you what P5JS is. And that's the best. It's the best resource out there. And it's for okay. free. And, right. uh, I'll check it, it out. It, it, yeah, it, it, it really is good. And, and um, you make great progress. But as also, I think it's actually like, uh, FX has courses right now. Also, I I haven't oh, like, wow. I haven't like looked at it. And there's there's also like a lot of on FX tax, for example, how to get started. Um, but really, da Daniel Daniel Schiffman, the coding train, like that's one of my go-to resources to give out because he explains and explains it in such a good way. Um, Schiffman. Yeah, the, the coding train. The coding train. Okay, yeah. I'll look that up. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Um, and yeah, yeah you, have Colin. fun at Art Basel. Yes, thank you. I uh, hope to see all of you. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> all right, guys. Cool stuff, guys. I got to jump, but uh, thanks again. Peace. Awesome. Take care. See well, you guys. Bye -bye. Thanks again, Paul. Bye. Crypto Slam has some of the most comprehensive data in the NFT industry. Contact us today to find out more about our free and enterprise API. Thanks again for tuning in.